All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to today's talk. The title is Thinking of Novel Ways for Insect Management in Soybean. This is uh, already the 26 talks of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope this series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker today. Dr. Pan Niao is currently an assistant professor of the Department of Biology at the Hong Kong Baptist University. He obtained his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Hong Kong and received postdoctoral training in Professor Meilan Chai's team at the University of Hong Kong. And um, also the distinguished professor Natalia to the reference laboratories in Purdue University in the United States for the postdoc and Professor John Howard's group at Cardiff University in the United Kingdom, also as a postdoc. So Dr. Leo's uh, research focused on plant biotechnology, biochemistry, isoprenoid metabolism, lipid metabolism, pathway discovery, and pathway cost talk. He has published 44 papers in Nature Chemical Biology, PNAS, Plant Biotechnology Journal, Trends in Biotechnology, Biotechnology Advances, and so on. Dr. Liao has six granted Chinese patent and one granted US patent. In this presentation, Dr. Liao will introduce his recent work on isoprenoid and lipid biosynthesis and metabolism and share with us his thoughts about whether we could develop some novel ways for insect management in soybeans based on his research background and some latest progress in this area. So let's welcome Professor Liao to the floor. Professor Liao, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Lam. Yeah, so um, first I want to thank Professor Lam for giving me this chance. Um, uh, it is my great honor to uh, be here to share with you uh, some of our studies and also share with you some of my uh, thoughts about um, this topic. Yeah, okay. So, so my current research interests include like plant and food biotechnology of healthy promoting uh, compounds, as well as like plant biochemistry and uh, metabol uh, metabolize. Um, as well as pathway discovery of uh, valuable natural um, products. I'm also interested in, uh, uh, in the regulation, transporter, and the release of volatiles in plants. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, I also want to like uh, develop new ways to protect the plants against the stress, uh, including insects, and increase seed yield and the nutrition as well as generate a novel strategies to produce value-added uh, value compounds or increase the uh, accumulation. Okay, so this is today's outline. Yeah, so first I'm, I'm going to talk about like the, the role of cuticle, uh, how cuticle affects the release of volatiles, yeah, uh, followed by a related study, but uh, uh, maybe also in, uh, related to like uh, uh, how vol terpene volatiles could be used as a way to protect uh, the flowers against the microorganisms. Yeah, and then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a little bit about the biosynthesis and the biotechnology of a terpene noise. Uh, finally, I'm going to uh, provide several recent examples, like uh, people are using, uh, how people are using uh, pheromones for insect management. Yeah, so for the first part, um, so this is some background information about uh, volatiles, okay? So plant volatile uh, organic compounds, they have many different functions. For example, they play important role in uh, reproduction, defense, uh, stress protection, as well as pest uh, management. Actually, they, the volatiles they emitted could be uh, 
like attract some insects for uh, for example like bees for the uh, pollination okay yeah they also contributed to the atmospheric chemistry for example like from trees and there are a lot of volatiles coming out release um, of course, they also caused uh, some maybe some of the contaminations from in the uh, factories. They uh, also involve in plant plant communication and uh, uh, contribute to the flavor of the a lot of fruits and uh, to the um, volatiles or like a smell sense of a lot of different flowers. Yeah, we can also see a lot of commercial products which are quite. Uh, yeah, useful in daily life as well as some expensive like uh, fl fragrances. Um, so actually, in the past the two, get, uh, two decades, the uh, biosynthesis pathways for for the volatiles in petunia flowers have been um, basically like uh, they are uh, mostly clear now. Uh, many uh, most of the genes are responsible for the. Uh, for, for the biosynthesis of different uh, like uh, volatiles have already been discovered. Yeah, uh, so for this kind of compounds, most of them are the phenylpropanoids. Yeah, all some of them are benzo, uh, benzo noise. So after the volatiles have been synthesized in the cytosol uh, or in the plastid, they have to move uh, from the cytosol to the plasma membrane. So uh, once one way is that they could be uh, transferred with the help of vesicles. Okay. Another way is that they could be uh, with the help of lipid transfer proteins. But both ways they can uh, reach the plasma membrane. So uh, one possibility is that the volatiles could be go through the plasma membrane through exocytosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another way is that. And uh, they need the help of uh, another like a plasma membrane localized uh, ABC transporter. Yeah, and then they, uh, after crossing the plasma membrane, they, they need to go to the cell wall. Okay, so for the cell wall, uh, our uh, PRS hypothesis is that maybe uh, some like a lipid uh, transfer proteins located in the cell wall might help in this step. And then finally, it will be they will be diffused in a cuticle, yeah, and then finally uh, uh, be emitted to the atmosphere. So uh, actually, um, my supervisor, like uh, in Purdue, uh, previously they identified a, a volatile transporter, which is located in a plasma membrane. Yeah, uh, maybe five years ago. Yeah. So yeah, they published the latest paper in Science as a cover story. Yeah, this is the first uh, like a volatile transporter that have been um, uh, found out. Um, and, and then actually previously, they also uh, did some mathematical modeling, like a calculation, like a, they, uh, they actually found out that out of these different barriers, including plasma membrane, cell wall, and the cuticle, they found out that the prediction, they predicted that the cuticle imposed the highest resistance for the release of cuticles. However, uh, it has never been uh, experimentally demonstrated. Yeah, so uh, what we have done is that we uh, actually first check like uh, uh, how much of the volatiles are located in the cuticle, specifically in this part. Okay, so our results showed that actually there are more than 50% of the volatiles are located in the uh, cuticle part. And then the remaining uh, volatiles are inside, inside the plasma membrane, including the cytosol. Yeah. So actually the, the first question we want to ask is that, like uh, what is the role of cuticle for the release of uh, volatiles in particular flowers? So first, uh, let me introduce a little bit about uh, the plant cuticle. So actually, the uh, this is a leaf uh, sample. So uh, the cuticle is the most outside layer, okay, as you can see here. So um, the the like the default function of cuticle is that it can act uh, acts as a molecular transporter barrier, protect the plants from drought, stress, and the pathogen infection. Uh, it can also prevent organ fusion during development. Um, although the interaction between interaction of the 
atmospherical uh, VOCs with the cuticle has been ex extensively reported previously. Um, how the volatiles in uh, flowers affect the emission of volatiles, like how the cuticle affect the emission of volatiles uh, is still unknown. So, uh, so to answer this question, we are thinking that, um, uh, so because we want to uh, investigate the effect of cuticle, okay? So we want to find a way to affect the cuticle property. Yeah, so by searching uh, literature, we found out that actually in apodopsis, now already ABCD 11, uh, 12, 13 has, have been reported that they are uh, wax transporter. Okay, so, um, so what we want to do, we, we are thinking that oh, maybe we can find the wax specific ABC transporter in petunia flowers, and then uh, we can uh, like a down regulating uh, of them. Okay, so here, um, because peer research, we already have the transcription of uh, like a trans, uh, transcript, uh, transcriptome uh, data from petunia flowers. And then by searching this iron sick data, we found out uh, two homologs. One is in the homolog of Abadopsis ABCG11. Another one is uh, the homolog of uh, ABCG12. Okay, we, they, they uh, respectively show maybe 78 and uh, 68, 66% identity. So uh, we want a down regulation of ABCG11 or ABCG12 in a petunia flower under the driving of a petal specific MYB1 promoter from this plant. Uh, uh, so uh, although we tried both, but finally we only generated uh, several, we could only able to generate the several I lines uh, that are downregulating ABCG12, as you can see here. So uh, for the follow-up experiments, we choose the, the these three lines, like seven, eight, and nine, which show the most uh, significant uh, down regulation. So the first thing we have done is that we we check the wax amount. As you can see here, actually, the, in, indeed, the total wax amount was significantly reduced in all three I lines. And then um, we have a look at the uh, compositions of each kind of the uh, major compound or major group of the uh, wax. Actually, there's not much, uh, like uh, no significant difference for the composition. So um, to test the, the, whether there's any deficiency for the, for the cuticle in a transgenic plant, actually we use the atunidine blue dye, as you can see here. So uh, when, when, uh, when, I mean, when the cuticle is intact, uh, it, it has no effect on on a, for example, on a wild type, okay? When there is some deficiency, it, the tulipin blue will be more easily to go, uh, to penetrate inside. So it will show the uh, blue color. So as you can see here, after the four hours of staining, we can clearly see the blue, uh, like a color from the, on the three uh, eye, eye lines, but not the wild type and the vector control. So indicating that, oh, indeed, there is some uh, deficiency of the cuticle after the downregulating uh, ABCG12. Uh, so we also did the TEM uh, pictures to analyze the uh, cuticle thickness uh, between the wild type and then the ABCG12-9, which is the, uh, like a, the downregulation is, is the most significant one, yeah. So as you can see here, actually, indeed, the cuticle thickness was reduced in the mutant. Um, actually, after calculation, it, it showed 20% uh, uh, reduction. Furthermore, we also like uh, uh, get the SEM pictures of the petals. For, so for example, you can see here from a white type, all the cuticle cells, they are uh, quite uniform. Okay, but here we can see that some of them are still fine, but some of the cells, especially this, they lost the cuticle shape and become flattened. Okay, actually from the flowers here, you can see actually the flowers are become smaller and less smooth. Okay, and they also they are uh, uh, become like more transparent. 
so okay so now we know that we got a good system that uh, like uh, we we have some transgenic flowers that show defects in the cuticle so uh, so now we want to ask uh, to answer also our question like uh, what is the effect on the release of volatiles so our previous uh, hypothesis is that like uh, uh, if the if the cuticle, so because the cuticle is thinner now, okay, we are we are thinking that because it was a berry before, right? For, for example, like, like the default uh, function of cuticle, so, uh, but uh, our results indicating that in, they are not the emission was not increased. I mean the volatiles are not increased. Uh, on the contrast, by contrast, the emission, the total emission was reduced in all the three. Uh, ionized. Furthermore, we found out that uh, also the total internal pool were also reduced. So this indicating that maybe the biosynthetic flux was also reduced. So by calculation, yeah, we found indeed, yeah, all, all the biosynthetic flux for all the three ionized was also reduced. So uh, in order to determine like uh, where in a scent biosensitive network in the inhibition takes place, it can be either the upstream of volatile uh, uh, compound synthesis, like the phi, like the phenylalanine biosynthesis, or downstream of the phi, which is the VOC biosynthesis, okay? So what do we have done? We have feed in the, uh, like a stable label, the phi, uh, to our plants, and then we check then the total, for example, the VOC synthesis and then the VOC emission. So our results indicating that actually after the feeding, the VOC synthesis was recovered to the wild type level. However, the VOC emissions st still are significantly lower than that in the wild type. So this results indicating that so actually in the transgenic plants, Petals, the VOC by sensitive capacity was not affected. Uh, uh, when we further analyze the gene expressions, like uh, for example, the genes in the feed bar synthesis, including DHP synthesis, EPSPS, CM1, CM2. Uh, so the old one is a transcriptional factor, which you can regulate in these several enzymes, these several genes. Uh, as well as the ABCG1, which is a volatile transporter so that identified in our lab previously. Yeah, so actually all the gene expression of all these genes are downregulated, um, suggesting that the P reduction in the ABCG12 ion lines is transcriptionally uh, regulated. So uh, the next question we want to answer is that, uh, for example, previously we uh, Already analyzed the cuticle, say, like uh, the distribution of our volatiles of volatiles in the cuticle part and also internally. You know, so actually this is a method that we developed. So how we are uh, we are doing this? So first we got the total internal pool from the um, volatiles by dipping this uh, by putting these three flowers in the DCM, which is an organic solvent. So. Um, also, we get the uh, wax and the volatile uh, um, uh, in Hessen, and then we dip them in a very short time, only two to five seconds. Okay, so for this part, uh, we just want to get the, for example, the, the volatiles from the cuticle part. Uh, as well, uh, uh, here we also get another set of sample like, to get the wax like in Hessen. Yeah, uh, finally for this one, we get a total wax in Hessen. For example, here we put the petals for 30 seconds in Hessen. So for this part, what I want to emphasize is that actually when people like extracting wax, they are doing uh, similarly like this. They just dip, for example, dip the flowers or stem, like stem in Hessen for several seconds. Okay, and the reason why we get the, uh, like a wax and total wax here is that we want to calculate uh, like a, a recovery rate. And then because uh, by two to five seconds, we are not sure that we get 100% of the volatiles from the cuticle part. Yeah, and there may be some re still remaining there. So we want to do the calculation to calculate back, yeah. Okay, so after uh, establishing the technique, then we uh, did the experiments. Uh, so actually, 
uh, we found out that in uh, all the uh, three transgenics, the distribution, like the volatile, now accumulate less in the cuticle uh, part, but, uh, but accumulate more inside them. You know, so if we calculate it, they accumulated about 20% uh, internally in the trans, uh, transgenic lines. So, um, because we know that if uh, if there are if the amount of the volatiles are too high in the plasma membrane, it will cause the toxicity. Okay. So here we use a method to to check whether uh, the accumulation of the internal uh, volatiles uh, cause the, the disruption for the uh, plasma membrane or not. So here, for example, this is the wild type. We are using a uh, uh, to, uh, we, uh, we are using a uh, uh, PI staining. This is a peridium pr iodide here. So, uh, so in for the integral cell, if there is no defect for the plasma membrane, the this uh, PI staining like solution cannot go go inside to the nucleus. Okay, so it cannot stain the nucleus. However, if there is a uh, defect deficiency for the plasma membrane, then the PI uh, solution will go to go inside to uh, stain the nucleus. As you clearly you can see from here in the uh, ABCG twelve ion lines, there are more dots here. Okay, which indicating that indeed uh, ABCG twelve down regulation causes the separate membrane. Uh, like a deficiency in the petunia flowers. Uh, so actually, uh, we did more experiments to, uh, so for example, here, this is the internal pools between the Y type and the ABCG12 uh, I, I9s and, uh, at a different time points. Okay, the most, uh, so for example, here for the emission uh, in the Y type, there's always a peak, for example, at about in the evening, we can see a peak at about 11, uh, 30. Okay, and then it great, gradually decreases. However, in the uh, ABCG 12 I, I9, basically it was, uh, the recommendation was lost. You see here, it, it, it's, it's already, uh, I mean, we can no longer see the peak in this uh, time point. Actually, even for the re redistribution, as you can see here, at the different time points, it was consistently much lower than that in a wild type. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have a, a summary uh, model here. So, for example, in a wild type, uh, at the normal uh, condition, the cuticle can hold about 50% of the volatiles. Uh, however, uh, when the cuticle signals were reduced, uh, it can hold less of the volatiles. You know, about 20% of the volatiles have to go inside to the plasma membrane, which caused the uh, tox toxicity and then triggered the feedback inhibition, which like uh, caused the down regulation of all the genes in, uh, in uh, for the biosynthesis of phi. Yeah. So finally caused the uh, reduction of volatiles. Yeah, so this st uh, story has been published in Nature Chemical Biology as a cover story. Um, so this uh, is a summary about this study. So first, the cuticle uh, serves as a resistant barrier for VOC emission. It holds more than 50% of the internal VOCs, that's acting as a Think uh, storing VOCs to sustain efficient emission and protect the cells from VOC toxicity. Uh, cuticle provides little resistance for compounds with relatively higher volatility, but does limit diffusion of VOC with low volatility. Okay, so I didn't just, uh, show the results for this part. Yeah, this is also an, uh, an interesting part. Yeah, so only nodes like uh, volatiles with no uh, volatility was affected by the cuticle. Yeah, for those with very high volatility, they, they are not affected by the cuticle sickness. Yeah, so the inability of VOCs to build up in a thinner cuticle leads to redistribution of internal VOC pools and results in uh, cellular uh, damage. Cells can sense changes in the intracellular VOC distribution and the feedback inhibit the VOC biosynthesis at the transcriptional level. Yeah. Uh, six, 
cuticle is more than a simple diffusion barrier, but a member of a VOC biosynthetic network. Okay, so we're we going before we go to the second story. Professor Nam previously asked me a question. How, so in this like uh, transgenic uh, petals like ABCD12 and ionized, how about the levels of terpenes in those transgenic petals? Because actually, uh, all uh, how to say uh, petunia flowers, the major uh, volatiles are phenylpropanoids or benzoenoids. Okay, actually they, they are not terpenoids. So although we didn't analyze uh, the terpenoids in in our in my transgenic petals, uh, but uh, Professor Nam's question reminds me uh, another study that have been conducted by my peers never made. Okay, um, so they, they actually he did some work on uh, uh, terpenoids in uh, petunia flowers. So I'm going to introduce a little bit about this work. Uh, so natural fumigation as a mechanism for Terpene uh, volatile transport between flower organ, uh, organs. Yeah, so this is Ben, who is the first author. So now she, uh, he was uh, also a, a postdoc in Purdue University in uh, the same same lab as me, and then now he's already in uh, France for several years. Yeah. So they found out that like, natural fumigation uh, is a new mechanism for the volatile transport between flower organs. So here, the volatile he's talking about is about the terpenoids, okay? Specifically, uh, sesquin terpenoids. Um, so first, uh, he found out like uh, several of the sesquinoids uh, senses expressed in the petunia flowers. To answer Professor Lam's question, okay, so uh, actually, indeed, in uh, what type of flowers, like for example, during uh, development, okay, there's a bud uh, one to two cm, and then bud three to four cm, and then uh, even older day zero, and then uh, and this is like uh, after uh, anthesis, uh, two days after the anthesis, okay, this is uh, during this uh, flower development. So he detected like a four. Mm, subsequent terpenes. But uh, actually, for example, if you see from the uh, uh, gamma green D, basically it's, it has higher level in pistol, you know, in the pistol specifically, they are keep on increasing. Also here in stamen, uh, here the gamma green D also uh, reached the peak uh, in the final, like in day two. But for these two, they looks quite, the levels are quite low. Yeah. Also for this compound, beta cadenin. So for example, here also still for the pistol, you know, in, they, they are accumulated to a very high level during the flower development. Yeah, uh, similar, uh, have a similar trends uh, I cared for these two compounds, you see, in pistols, okay. But for, for this, um, only for the stem, only in the final stage, looks like it, it was, uh, increased. So, and then uh, out of the three, out of the three TPS, okay, for the TPS2, actually he found that a TPS2 is responsible for the geraniol production. So geraniol is a monoterpene, okay. And then for other three, uh, TPS1, TPS3, TPS4, he found out that actually like uh, all these three, they, uh, they are having function for the uh, biosynthesis of sesquin terpenes. Uh, some interesting thing you may be found out from here. So for example, this is a P TPS1, which show very high expression in the tube. Okay, not in pistol. Yeah, this is something strange. For example, here, because all these compounds are accumulated in a high level in the pistol. Okay, not in the tube. Yeah, and for the TPS3 and the TPS4, both of them are, expressed at a very high level in the pistol. Okay, so he also did some biochemical uh, characterization for this three uh, uh, TPS. As you can see here, so for example, for the TPS3, uh, it can only um, synthesize, biosynthesize the, the beta catenin. You, can, you see, only one peak, we can find, only find one peak here. For the TPS2, looks like also somehow uh, specific, uh, it can produce more of the beta catenin here, the blue blue peak, and also Laridol, okay? 
maybe uh, uh, also some some more several small peaks here, but uh, they are they are very small. I mean the level means uh, are very low. So only for TPS three, as you can see here, it can be um, it can responsible for the biosynthesis of gamma green D, also like a bi um, bicyclo gamma green, uh, as well as other two or three. You see. Uh, so, which means that it looks like the TPS one is the only one responsible for the biosynthesis of the uh, all the three compounds. Okay, so TPS four and three seems quite a specific. Yeah. Okay. So these are some important information. So here uh, another very important information from here is that um, the TPS one expressed at a very high level in a tube. However, in the flowers, uh, the accordingly, like the TPS product, they, they produce at a very high level in the pistol, but not in the tube, which is not consistent. Okay, so the hypothesis that maybe uh, like the product produced by the TPS1 in the tube could be like a somehow like a fumigate, you know, or transport from the tube to the pistol. Yeah, so actually they did a lot of experiments. I am not going to give details for this part, but I, well, I want to like summarize the key point here. So what they found is that TPS expression at the top, like uh, expressed at the top uh, of the tube, okay, like the tube here, yeah, red color showing. Uh, they are expressed specifically at a high level in the tube. And then at the day minus uh, at the day uh, like uh, two days after the synthesis uh, analysis, the emission of TPS one products into the blood headspace. So for example, when uh, it expresses at a high level, and then it release products, right? It release the subsequent terpenes, yeah, in the headspace. So uh, uh, another day, like uh, one day after. The accumulation of TPS products in the stigma and the answers promoting the stigma development. Yeah, one way they are promoting the stigma stick, uh, development. And then uh, one day la later, at the answers, uh, subsequent terpenes protect the stigma against the microorganisms and are regulated at, and are required for normal stigma development. You see, so this is something interesting. Uh, like, uh, Maybe the so the results showing that the system uh, sits the uh, terpenes originally maybe uh, like uh, derived from the tube and then they like uh, somehow emitted right they emitted and then go to the go to the stigma and then affecting the behavior of stigma. Yeah, I just show some representative uh, results here. Actually, and they also generated the eye lines of the TPS1, and they found out that actually the stigma size was reduced in both uh, directions. Okay, and then they also did a uh, st statistical analysis, and then all these uh, parameters are show significantly re reduction. Uh, also, actually, they also did a uh, Experiment to test the behavior uh, of the pet, uh, pistols against the, the micro uh, microbiomes. Yeah, so the results indicating that um, when they lacking of the uh, like uh, for the in the TPS RNI, which is the yellow color, when the subsequent terpenes are lacking or reduced, actually there are more of the uh, bacteria being found. Okay, in in a, in a ionized in comparison to the wild type, so which is showing that oh, actually the subsequent therapy fumigation uh, changed the pistol micro uh, microbiomes. Uh, a follow up like uh, experiment that they have done is that they also found out that actually uh, in the ionized uh, the basically the seed yield was was like uh, affected was reduced. Okay, and then this are the uh, total weight of the seeds per, per flower and then the seeds per flower. Yeah, so which um, both of these two parameters were significantly reduced in uh, three iron lines, then the Y type. 
Yeah. So uh, this uh, the conclusion is uh, like the flower fumigation also affects the pistol growth and the seed yield. Yeah. So the major conclusion here from this study is that uh, it demonstrated a new uh, physiological phenomenon: inter uh, interorgan uh, aerial transport of terpenoid VOCs while uh, natural fumigation. So before the uh, petunia flower open, a tube specific uh, terpene sensor is produced the sesquim terpene, which are released inside the buds and then accumulated in a stigma, potentially defending the developing stigma from pathogens. pathogens. The, this VOC is also affect the reproductive organ development and the seed yield, which are previously unknown functions of terpene uh, compounds. Yeah, this is another story like related to therapy noise in petunia flowers. And then it looks like they also play some potential like uh, uh, functions like against the uh, uh, pathogens. Yeah, so we, we uh, actually I'm thinking that for example, if we overexpress this TPS1, maybe they could show like a increased uh, like a tolerance to the pathogens and also maybe increase the development and the seed yield. Yeah, yeah so, uh, for my, so for my so for the set part, I'm going to introduce you a little bit about the biosynthesis and the biotechnology of terpenoids. Um, so as we know, maybe um, most of you may be aware, actually the, the uh, secondary metabolites which, which also called a like specialized uh, metabolites in comparison to the primary metabolites, okay? So there are more than 70,000 uh, terpene noise, uh, which is one of the biggest group of the secondary metabolites. And there are also other groups, for example, like phenopapal noise, which we introduced uh, just now about the particular flowers. And also the, another big group is uh, acnoids. Yeah, many echinoids are also show uh, anti-cancer activity. So for the organic, uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, there are already like more than 1700 identified from 90 uh, plants. So which also include the terpenoids, phenopropanoids, benzo, uh, benzoanoids, uh, and also fatty acid derivatives, okay? Uh, as well as like uh, amino acid derivatives. Also there are some uh, very few like a, uh, species, genius specific uh, compounds. Yeah, what I want to emphasize here, for example, uh, some terpene noise uh, could be uh, pheromones. Okay, also some fa fatty acid derivatives also can, could be uh, pheromones. Yeah, so the function of uh, like most of these uh, secondary metabolites, and they show anti-cancer activity or anti-insect uh, or bacteria activity. Okay, the potential applications include, like, uh, for example, in agriculture, they could you be used to increase food quality, nutrition, and stress tolerance. Yeah. Uh, so these are uh, two previous examples. Like, uh, this is Tuyo Yo who got the Nobel Prize in Physical Physiology and or Medicine in, in 2015 uh, for, like, uh, because uh, her findings for, like, uh, uh, a way to extract a substance, atomicity, uh, atomicity, uh, yeah, actually atomicity is also a kind of sesquim terpenoid, okay, yeah, which uh, inhibits the marilla, marilla uh, parasite. So this is Jay uh, Cassidy from the uh, University of California, Berkeley. So he used the synthetic biology to reconstitute all the biosynthetic pathways for at atomicity, okay, in the East, and then uh, produced in the, like the precursor of the, uh, of this compound. And then uh, this, this technique has also been uh, reached to the commercial uh, platform, uh, maybe nearly 10 years ago, yeah. Okay, so there are also like many examples showing that people are working on this area, like people still working, uh, working on like a discovery of engineering of uh, this is a kind of uh, acronoids biosynthesis. This is also another kind of uh, acronoids. So um, this is also a, like a, a kind of anti-cancer uh, uh, compounds. So for example, here this is Dansen Tong from Dansen, which is a Chinese medicinal plant. 
Yeah, so also this one is also an anti plant uh, uh, compound. Yeah, so for this project, uh, when I was in Purdue in uh, uh, Natalia to the Rivers lab, they got a mint genome project. Okay, so uh, which, which are led by four uh, uh, co PIs. So this is Robin. Uh, he, uh, she, she, uh, she was previously in Michigan State University. Okay, so now uh, she moved to the University of Georgia. Yeah, her expertise is genomics and the transcriptomics. Yeah, so this is Sarah. Previously, she, she was in JIC uh, in the UK. So now she, she moved to Germany to the Max Planck uh, Institute. Uh, so her expertise is uh, mainly on the biochemistry, especially in the, the ethanoid biosynthesis. Okay, so yeah, so my previous supervisor, she mainly uh, works on the terpene noise and the phenocarbon noise. Yeah, so. Uh, Professor Dongjus, uh, they they are from the University of Florida, and then they they basically uh, interested in the plant uh, evolution. Yeah. Okay. So um, once they gave us some samples from different tissues of this uh, plant, like uh, this is also a mint plant. Yeah. Or Chinese medicinal plant. Yeah, we in Chinese we call it Niu Zi. This is oregano uh, 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 Yeah. So when I analyzed these compounds, I found several interested. Uh, I mean, when I analyzed the uh, metabolic profiles of the, from these uh, four tissues, I found uh, several interesting compounds, including thymol, cavacuro, thymol hydroquinone, and thymol quinone. And then they, they show different levels in different uh, tissues. For example, like uh, uh, for thymol hydroquinone and thymol quinone, they show the highest level in mature leaves, followed by the flowers uh, and the stem and the young leaves, they show similar levels. Yeah. So actually, thymol uh, quinone has been reported to like uh, uh, against the cancer for many years, but how it was biosynthesized is still unknown. So for example, this is the proposed biosynthetic pathway. So people propose that, oh, they may use, uh, propose that uh, Kavakuro and all thymol could be used as the precursors for the bio, uh, biosynthesis of thymol hydroquinone. So from this structure, we can see from here. So actually they are just the, the difference between this and this one is just uh, another like a uh, uh, hydroxidation group here, as you can see. Also here, you see, if we compare this, there's just a, a addition of a hydroxidation group here. So uh, we think that it should be uh, hydroxylase involved here uh, for a hydroxylation uh, reaction, okay? So for, from thymohydroquinone to thymoquinone, so as you, if we compare these two structure, we found out that oh, actually the hydroxidation become like the oxygen or, or only the hydrogen was missed, uh, right? Was released. So which means that this is the oxidation step. So we hypothesize it should be catalyzed by a dehydrogenase. Okay. So uh, the research ob objective of this study is that we want to discover how the thymohydroquinone is biosynthesized in the laminaceae family. And also we will do the functional identification of this uh, the candidate genes in yeast and the plant. Okay, so this is our strategy. So basically uh, we also got the transcriptional data. Okay, besides the uh, metabolized profiling data, we also got the ISIC data from those four tissues. Yeah, in total we have about 70,000 transcripts. Uh, because we know that uh, the first step should be a hydroxylase, okay? So which usually catalyzed by a uh, cytochrome P450, okay? So our first criteria is that we, we search for this one, P450, cytochrome P450. And then we found about 450 uh, transcripts, okay? And then actually we did the uh, correlation analysis between the uh, metabolized levels like a thymohydroquinone and then the expression, uh, gene expression of this 450 uh, P450 genes. Okay, and then we also set the PCN R value, 
like should be bigger than 0 0.7 and p-value should be lower than 0 0.01, okay? And then uh, we got 40, uh, 42 remaining. So our uh, third criteria is that we, we exclude the, because we know that usually the P450 in the size of, the average size of P450 is 1.5 KB, okay? So we exclude the 24 transcripts with the ORF less than uh, 1300 BP, okay? After that, we also exclude the two candidates that are expressed at a very low level, for example, the average uh, FPK are lower than five, okay? This gave us 16 remaining. So uh, next, we exclude the seven candidates that are predicted to be involved in the triterpene uh, noise biosynthesis. Okay, because now we are looking for a, for, for a gene involved in the monoterpene uh, monoterpene biosynthesis. Okay, yeah. So this leave us like eight candidates. Actually, we choose the least indicate uh, these eight candidates for uh, functional verification in tobacco. However. One of them was not founded in a uh, as, assembled uh, or, uh, organa genome, and it is a predicted coding sequence based on the transcript, transcription data uh, cannot be amplified by PCR. So this candidate has also been excluded. So finally, actually, uh, we checked uh, seven candidates, okay? And then out of the seven candidates, we found that two were functional. Yeah, so this, this is some representative results we are showing. So here, this is the metabolized levels in Oregon uh, uh, vigory in these four tissues. And then these are the, like, uh, the, gene, the gene expression of these seven candidates in, in, uh, according, uh, like, uh, the, in the corresponding tissues, okay? Um, actually, finally, this is the correlation PCM value, like, uh, like a G, uh, gene and the metabolite correlation analysis, so between the metabolites and then the gene expression. Okay, as you as you as we can see here, so actually for the CYP one and the two, which was finally found out to be the functional ones, are showing higher correlation with the thymohydroquinone and the thymoquinone. Okay, so these are some results just uh, uh, demonstrating that like uh, uh, actually these two candidates can use. Uh, both Taimon and Kabakuro as substrate to produce the uh, product Taimon hydroquinone, as you can see here. So one thing I want to mention is that, for example, 18 is Taimon hydroquinone, okay? So actually in the empty vector control, we can also see uh, the production, like a small amount of the, and the a small amount of the hydro, uh, Taimon hydroquinone. So this, uh, Indicating that actually the native P450s exist in the tobacco system. Okay, so however, we also check that this uh, these two genes functions in yeast. Okay, so in yeast, in the empty vector control of yeast, we cannot see any of the thymohydroquinone here. So which further demonstrating our uh, our results. Yeah, and uh, our conclusion is that actually these two CYPs can use both Kavakuro and the Timon to produce Timon hydroquinone. Uh, with regarding to the final step, like from Timon hydroquinone to Timon quinone. Yeah, so uh, actually we noticed that in the, there is like a non-enzymatic conver conversion of Timon hydroquinone to Timon quinone. As you can see here, if we put in the the standard of the thymol hydroquinone at a different temperature, like in seven days, okay, for example, this are the different temperature, we put them uh, just at a different temperature, we, we do nothing, okay, we just put them at the bench. Uh, and then we found out that actually the thymol hydroquinone was reducing, okay, during the seven days, seven day period. Uh, however, the thymol quinone is uh, increasing, you see? So each day we analyze these samples. This is uh, this are analyzed by Ben uh, in France. So you can see here. Uh, so this indicating that so actually there's uh, uh, non enzymatic conversion happening. You know. So however, the possibility for the conversion of thymol hydroquinone, like a catalyzed by a uh, alcohol dehydrogenase activity, or like other CYPs in the plant, still cannot be excluded. 
so so actually uh, what I have fixed uh, I have solved is this this step. No, I found out these two these two uh, people fifties are responsible for using uh, Taimon and Kavakuro to produce Taimon hydroquinone. Yeah, so we we collaborate with others to like uh, to publish the whole pathway. Uh, the Germanist group, they found out some CYPs involved in this step, like they can use the gamma terpene, and then they will pr uh, to produce some of the intermediates, okay? And then with the help of the SDR, also is a dehydrogenase, and then they will also form, form some of the intermediates, and then become like a Taimo and or Kavakuro. Okay, so this is the whole story from here. Yeah, so we are thinking that actually similar strategies could also be applied to discover uh, biosynthetic pathways for other valuable uh, terpenoids. Uh, and I want to emphasize that actually also even for uh, pheromones, some of them are like uh, monoterpenes or sesquine terpenes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, actually we uh, for this area, I also did some other uh, studies, but I, I just want to give a brief summary here. So I, we also like uh, while I was in uh, Hong Kong U, I also uh, with other collaborators, we also did reported the lower strategies to increase healthy promoting compound levels in tomato. Yeah, especially like vitamin E and uh, um, lycopene, yeah, carotenoids and so on. We also like uh, uh, have some new ways to increase plant growth and seed yield in tobacco. Yeah, we have some uh, new approach to protect the plants from uh, free, freeze stress in Apodopsis flowers. Yeah, we also reported a, a way to protect the plants against the drought and the uh, stored stress, as well as the pathogen infection in rice. Yeah. Uh, so finally, we also found out some. Uh, Crosstalk between different pathways, which can be potentially used to regulate lipid metabolites, sterile biosynthesis, um, glucosinate biosynthesis, and the central metabolic uh, pathways. Yeah, these are some previous like press releases in newspapers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a brief introduction. For example, uh, we we try to overexpress of a gene in, which is HMGS, but we are not overexpressing the like the native HMGS, we we actually uh, use a mutated like a, a single mutation, okay, of the HMGS, which is S359A, which show tenfold higher uh, enzyme activity in vitro. Okay, so now when we overexpress that mutant like S359A, we could increase the scoring, the production of scoring, as well as the three of the phytosterols downstream of the MVA pathway, but uh, besides this, we can also increase the uh, lycopene, vitamin E, and the pro-vitamin E. Yeah. So here, uh, actually, uh, we want to explain why, for example, when, when there is a single mutation here, uh, why they show better uh, effect when they are obvious in plants. Okay. So we also got the crystal structure for the, uh, this single mutation. Actually, our results show that the... Uh, like acetyl-CoA ligand, S359A, uh, revealed that a loss in the hydrogen bonding between the S359 and the acetyl-CoA improved, uh, improved the activity of 359A. Yeah, so for this part, we, we, we collaborated with Dr. Low in, uh, in Hong Kong U uh, using a SWARF MS, uh, like a quantitative uh, Protein omics. Yeah, we found out some connection between the MVA pathway and the glucosinator biosynthesis. Yeah, so these are some uh, studies, uh, like papers we published when I was in Hong Kong U. Uh, yeah, a long time ago, we also like uh, try to uh, clone, like uh, clone some genes in the upstream of the MVA pathway and the MEP pathway, and then we also did some like uh, functional identification of the GGPPS. Uh, in the E. coli, yeah, and then we also screen some key genes for the Dancenton biosynthesis using uh, 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 elicit, uh, you know, and we found out that actually like HMGR, DXS, TGPPS, and CPS are the most important genes for for this um, uh, for Dancenton biosynthesis. And finally, we always first release uh, key genes in 
dancing like uh, dancing hybrid rules. Okay, and then finally we could uh, increase the dancing tone production by nearly fivefold. Yeah, recently we also contributed a review paper for the uh, in uh, for trends in biotechnology about the uh, the use of the hybrid rules culture for um, value added products. Okay, so basically this is a kind of a, a, a small summary about what I did previously. I think I also have, uh, so we do, we evolved in the pathway discovery of, and we also do metabolic engineering and the therapy noise of uh, and the lipids. And finally, we also in, uh, investigated the volatile release mechanisms. I think I also have another, uh, yeah, another part about the, yeah, so we, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, some like a recent examples of using hormones for insect uh, management. So uh, first, I want to talk about a little bit about uh, some basic information about uh, pheromones. So pheromone is a secreted or uh, excreted uh, chemical factor that triggers a social response in uh, members of the same species. Pheromones are chemicals capable of acting like hormones outside of the body of secreting individual to affect the behavior of the receiving individuals. So um, by 1990 till now, actually there are more than 50 kinds of artificially synthesized insect pheromones had been uh, conventionalized for insect uh, situation if, uh, investigation, and most of them are sex pheromones. So we 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 should be aware that like uh, for the chemical pe uh, pesticides there are some issues. For example, they they could cause the pest resistance. They destroy the ecology balance. They can also pollute the uh, environment uh, extra. So uh, these issues uh, require new efficient environmentally friendly, uh, no toxicity and uh, no residual chemical in insect insecticides, all natural uh, enemies insects and uh, microbial pesticides, okay, all insect uh, sterilization techniques and the insect uh, hormones. So in this topic, uh, we, are, uh, we want to uh, talk a little bit more about this one, okay, insect uh, hormones. So actually recently I noticed that there are some good papers published. So for example here, um, in this paper, actually, they, this compound, these pheromones, is a uh, monounsaturated fatty acid with a double bond at the position of 11. Okay, so which is a key intermediate in scenic worm pheromones by synthesis. So uh, actually, they they using the metabolic engineering overexpress several genes, and then they can produce this uh, compound in a high level in in a Oil, oil seed crop, okay. So uh, they also did, I, I mean, after getting this, they also like extract the pheromones from these transgenic plants. And then they, uh, they, they also did a uh, field trial and the efficiency show uh, is quite promising. I mean, and then there's no difference between the plant derived uh, pheromones and the synthesized, like a chemical synthesized pheromones. Okay, which is showing uh, quite promising. Yeah, and also like, uh, I think this is an expert in biotechnology in UK. So uh, Jonathan, he also commented like uh, the, the, I mean, this uh, genetically modified plants uh, could be used as a green factor, okay, to, to produce the pheromones, yeah. So I think, so this is a fatty acid related pheromones. I think uh, many insect pheromones are terpenes, for example, including monotropines and uh, subsequent terpenes. So for example, I also found some pictures, uh, no, some papers that actually they have used uh, test some of the sexual pheromones uh, to the soybean pod board, okay? Um, I think this is also related to this part. Mm, but one thing we should be care, uh, keep in mind is that actually the the pod burial is is only one of the insects. Okay, like uh, what the professor previously uh, like uh, he sent me a document. So 
about the introduction of the different source of the biostress uh, to soybeans. Okay, so this is only one kind of now. Yeah, and also uh, I noticed that in some of the papers, actually they are using a combination of the uh, of the pheromones. For example, they use geraniol. For example, here they using uh, like a E2 hexanol, like a benzoaldehyde, phenolacetyl uh, aldehyde, and so on. So sometimes, for example, here they are using like a, sometimes they are using a, a combination. Okay, and then. With a different dose of the that's the pheromones. Yeah. Let me check. Uh, yeah. So this is I think this is another study. But uh, I think from all these three uh, studies, and they are mentioning about this 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 compound. Yeah. I also checked that this compound. It is a new tech tech uh, technical uh, grade synthetic straight uh, chain. Which that is structurally similar or and mimic to a natural occurring uh, uh, pheromones produced by the female uh, fiber wall yeah, to attract the males for mating. Yeah, so I also searched the other papers. For example, there are some monotropins which have been uh, uh, have been reduced to be uh, pheromones. Uh, and so, for example, here this is another kind of monotherapies, uh, which is similar to lavandulolol. And here they also mention a new uh, monotherapies. So I also found some uh, like uh, at least one example, which is in the subsequent therapies produce pheromones precursors. Yeah. So actually here, um, I have some consideration. I mean, something we could we should be considered is that because. Uh, the advantage of the pheromones is that they are species uh, species specific. Okay, so which means that they can this kind of uh, pheromones they can only identify the own host. You know, they will not be affected by uh, I mean by, by by others. Which means that if we use this kind of pheromones, we will specifically affecting the behavior of the insect that we don't want. So. Yeah, this is one thing. Mm, another thing is, that, uh, I mean, for research, the, sometimes people are using a combination of volatiles. I mean, this combination could be make our study be more complicated. Yeah, and and for example, if there are 10, 10 commas there, right? How can we control like a different level or the ratios of each, each compound amongst each other? Yeah, and then how the insects are recognizing the Different ratio, right? So it could be complicated. Yeah, and also, uh, like what, like I said just now, for the soybeans, there are different kinds of insects to the soybeans. They affect the different area. For example, some insects are affecting the, the the leaves, right? Some of them affecting the pods, and some of them are affecting the roots. Yeah. So, which means that the, I mean different strategies or different pheromones may, may be needed, you know, for different like uh, even tissues. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so I think this is a, a brief summary. Uh, we first reported that the cuticle sickness affected the release of volatiles from the cells to the environment. And then we uh, discovered and engineered uh, thymohydroquinone biosynthesis in a medicinal plant. We also did some metabolic engineering of the MV pathway to increase the vitamin E, lycopene, and the uh, carotenoids. We also found some new connections between the MV pathway and the glucosinolate uh, biosynthesis. And we developed some new uh, approach to protect the plants, uh, including abdopsis and the rice against the freezing, uh, pathogen, salt, and the drought. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a long time ago, we also uh, cloned some genes in the pancentone biosynthesis and screened some key genes for the biosynthesis and demonstrated that the pancentone biosynthesis is mainly depending on the MEP pathway. Yeah, so finally, I gave some uh, examples about the pheromones for the insect management and uh, some some of my uh, my thoughts, I mean, with my um, research background, because I, Previously, I never worked on uh, soybeans before. Yeah. 
So I want to thank all the people, all the fundings, yeah, all the collaborators, yeah, and also uh, thank Professor Lang's uh, kind of invitation for today's talk. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, before we take on any questions, maybe let's um, take a picture together. So I, may mm -hmm. I invite uh, uh, everyone to turn on the camera and Jose Lau, please um, stop sharing first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Stop share. Okay. Okay. Then we can yeah. uh, start our Q and A session. So, yeah. anyone will be interested to ask the first question? You can just uh, mute yourself and talk, or type in your question. Everyone? Hello, everyone. Maybe yes. I can. Yes, please. Ask one uh, question. Uh, so Hello. my theory speech is still in now in Taiwan, right? Hi, <laughs> everyone. Long time yeah. no see. Yeah, so, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, comprehensive and uh, informative talk. So uh, I'm, I'm working on plant pathology, so I'm interested mm -hmm. about the um, micro uh, resistant parts. So the, yeah. the parts yeah. of the second, the, uh, towards the very end of the second part. So yeah. Uh, yeah. you mentioned that some uh, volatile compounds can uh, change the microbial behavior in the flower. So I'm curious yeah. about the uh, the way that these terpenoids act on microbe, um, the resistance of microbes. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not really uh, in the field of volatile compounds, but uh, based on just some textbook knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the terpenoids can either act directly to inhibit uh, insects or microbe growth because it is kind of toxic, Mm -hmm. And the second uh, mechanism is that some of these volatile compounds can attract natural enemies of the insects. Mm -hmm. So, but I think neither of these two pathways works on your experiment. So I'm curious how that volatile compound work, how the volatile compound can directly inhibit the microbe growth on the flower. So that's really interesting to me. Can you mm -hmm. provide some explanation? Yeah, I, I think for this, uh, my understanding is that oh, first, this this work is not done me, okay? done by me. Okay, this is done by by my colleague. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I mean, uh, my understanding for this paper is that like, uh, uh, for example, in a white hive, and there are certain amount of the sesquin uh, terpenes there, and uh, and uh, actually we already know. I mean, it's already know that the sesquin terpene uh, shown. Uh, like uh, antibacterial activity, okay? okay? Yeah, so so for example, for the wild type, there are certain amount of the sesquim terpenes in there. And then for the II, like the transgenic lines, the II line, like uh, which show down regulation of the TPS1, actually the sesquim terpenes are less in the stigma of the transgenics. Okay, okay, so yeah. uh, so which means that, uh, for example, when there are less of the sesquim therapy noise, uh, they observe that, that there are increased like uh, microbiomes in in the stigma of the uh, of the I I nine. Mm. Yeah, so they they actually they show other uh, other data which which I didn't show here uh, to prove like uh, there's no no significant change for the microbial uh, co community or something. Mm. They have another figure. I mean, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I didn't do this experiment by myself, and uh, yeah, I may miss some key information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. it's fine. But uh, yeah, but you can go to the paper. Yeah, to 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 have a look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I have another question about okay. the yeah. last part of your proposal, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you want to study uh insects resistant in soybean, right? And you will mm -hmm. find some reference about pheromones. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if you want to use insect pheromone to do the experiments, you might need to uh, involve some transgenesis. You need to introduce the insect gene into the plant, right? You're right. If you, yeah, yeah, you try yeah. to do that experiment. I'm just curious, uh, can you sh use an alternative way, say uh, the natural occurring terpenes in the soybeans? Can they uh, modulate insects attraction or repelling something like that? Because like uh, Professor Lam have a whole panel of soybean germplasms, right? Yeah. You can easily find certain uh, germplasm may have 
a higher level of certain turbinoids that mm -hmm. can yeah, attract yeah. or repel the insects. In that way, you don't really need to do transgenesis using insect genes. Right, right. This is also interesting. Yeah, I actually, like a previous professor uh, discussed with me, she, he said, that, oh, they have a lot of like different varieties of the soybeans. Yeah, yeah. they can have a, like a screening, you know, to test, like to first get the idea, like uh, how they, how about the metabolized profiling? How about like a, uh, what's the levels of the therapy noise, for example, in each uh, variety? Yeah, and then maybe we could uh, select some of the like uh, highest levels uh, varieties for some follow-up experiments. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, very good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Chen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so any other questions from uh, audience? Joanna, you need to unmute. Hi, uh, Dr. Liao. Thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. Just my question is maybe Professor Lam also can contribute. Are there any special group uh, of uh, researchers studying the soybean volatiles? Because the, the volatiles does contribute to the flavor. Mm -hmm. of the you know of the bean and the 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 end product made out of it so i'm just wondering is there anybody studying particularly any volatile compounds from soybean and the pathways yeah i see um um yeah for this part i may don't uh i'm not quite familiar but then there may be some people working on this maybe in the flavor yeah, of the soybeans, but for the volatiles, I'm not sure. Yeah, Professor <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know, that's not, not a very comprehensive study because um, soybean has a lot of secondary compounds and then people are already very busy about that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a lot of uh, volatiles. And I think it's a very, wide open area, it require the combination of strong chemistry and biochemistry, the technology together mm -hmm. with the new genomic technology and the giant parcel. I think that opened up a uh, very interesting study because in the past, I, as far as I remember, most of them are focusing on either mm -hmm. the chemical analysis alone yeah. or some pathway analysis uh, mm -hmm. using existing uh, genome data. But a combination of real um, biochemistry with the genome and germism uh, will be something exciting. So I'm looking forward to collaborate because on one hand, uh, when we're, we're talking about insects, this is because mm -hmm. Professor Jerome Ho uh, yeah. studying juvenile hormone. Yeah. And, and, and the juvenile hormone has a very similar structure compared to some of the terpenoid compound. So yeah. some terpenoid compound may interfere the development of insects. So there will be some natural uh, intestinicides that just disrupt the, the, the life cycle of the insects. That's why we all initiate all that. But as uh, Joanna mentioned, so we, today when we're talking about food in industry, is we are also looking for special favors that mm -hmm. ho ho hopefully, right, preferentially, mm -hmm. coming from the plant itself rather than artificially added. And they involve some um, some manipulation or some combinations uh, of genes. So by crossing different genomes, it's possible to put the metabolic enzymes into a different pathway because some are stronger, some are weaker. Yeah. Of course, that GM is the easiest. <laughs> you can just control the, the direction of growth, but then the, the, the customer may, be, may worry about it. Yeah, so yeah. maybe genome editing by enhancing or uh, reducing the activities of some enzyme, redirect the pathway, then you we can generate new favor. I think those are all possibilities that we can study. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Joanna, for a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. And also Professor No. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We can collaborate on this. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So any other questions? Yeah, I so thought maybe I, I, I asked. Right? So not just the terpenoid, but when you're talking about the uh, water compound from the flowers, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So, is there any um, how much study are there to to show that those um, volatile compound are related to the adaptability of a group of plants in a particular habitat? Is is it a a a, a relate? Uh, is it a, a genetic um, diversified genetics? So they just make make those compounds, and then the individual of the the lineage will will pick up the compounds, or this is the environmental driven things. So 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 different insects may end up to produce certain kinds of volatile compound, and not insects, but certain certain plants can produce uh, mm -hmm. a certain group of um, volatile compounds so that they can survive in a particular environment. Do you, do you have any um, information on that? Yeah, I mean this is a very um, very good question. Um, for me, I think actually the environment affect and the production of volatiles quite a lot. Yeah, so of course, like a different uh, um, like uh, plants or uh, flowers, they have some specific uh, uh, major compounds there. Yeah, um, but with, with regarding like to volatile uh, compounds, for example, in mint plants, I noticed that actually there are many different uh, varieties and then in different varieties, they produce different amount. Yeah, and this also even for the lavender plant, lavender flowers, we also noticed that actually uh, different varieties, they produce a uh, certain amount of the, uh, for example, monotherapy is in a very high level, but others, I mean, the chemical diversity is exist in even inside one species. Yeah. So outside one species, it may be more significant. Yeah. yeah actually, yeah. by rephrasing my questions, just yeah. wonder whether uh, the environmental selection will affect the evolution of those uh, volatile compounds. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, because uh, if the volatile, com volatile compound makes some special advantage uh, for the for the plants, right? So, so mm -hmm. if, would there be uh, some environmental selection? So that the evolution of uh, this complex pathway is regulated by some environmental factors. I'm not sure whether there's any answer for that, but just I'm just curious about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, the environmental or one one kind of environmental factor could be a selection. Um, myself don't uh, did not uh, aware of any this kind of study. Yeah, but I know that for example, but maybe by using GWAS, or if people have more like, a, um, how to say, different, many hundreds of the varieties with the known genomes, they can do GWAS to, yeah, to somehow, uh, to find some question about this. Yeah, but for for tomato uh, flavors, I know that for example, people in China they have done some, uh, similar uh, similar studies for the flavor in tomato. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, if not, I, let me uh, do some advertisement for the next talk. Okay. So, the next talk is very interesting. So, um, Katrin, can you, can you show the poster of next talk? Yes. Yeah, so, the next talk is uh, about earthworms. <laughs> so, I think earthworm is, is our friend uh, making the soil better for cultivation and agriculture. Uh, but there are different, different forms of uh, earthworms. Uh, they, they, they even um, go to different depth of the soil. So it, this is strongly related to the sustainable agriculture for the future. So we have invited um, uh, Michelle, yeah, uh, a uh, colleague in the School of Life Sciences to give a talk uh, on January 18, right? So, uh, he, she may um, we, she may uh, update her top title, but the title the the content is about how to use earthworms to sustain our agriculture. Yeah, so I, I think that's um it, it's it's a young faculty in our school uh, with a very uh, strong passion to earthworm and environment. It, it could be applied anywhere in the world. In, in the Chinese soil, we, we always have earthworm, but in international soils, I think earthworm can play an important role by maintaining a, a good environment for our, our crops. 
So um, Michelle will talk on January. Please uh, take a note of it. And if you are interested, uh, just scan the QR code and we also will send you um, email to invite you to join. Okay. So with that, I, I, I thank uh, Dr. Halel again. And yeah, so Merry Christmas to everyone in advance. <laughs> this is coming soon and we'll meet you next year. So already another year. <laughs> so see you next year. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.